This week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast is brought to you by Artbase. Are you managing an art collection, an artist studio, or even a gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? Well, Artbase is the right software to manage your art business. Artbase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. You just enter your data once and use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and so much more. And they've got a brand new version out right now with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com to learn more and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount. Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. On the podcast, we talk about many different facets of the art world and the art market, but we don't actually have artists on the podcast very often as guests. Recently, a few artists actually approached us about coming on the podcast to discuss what it's like to navigate the art market from the artist's perspective. We're really excited about this, as this really isn't covered very much in the art media. So in this week's episode of the podcast, we're joined by the artist Emily Mae Smith. We chat with Emily about having the artist's voice included in conversations about the art market, the stigma of artists following and speaking about their market, how she's managing her career now that she has commercial and institutional success, and she also shares some advice to rising artists. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks so much for listening. Emily, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Adam. Thank you. I'm super happy and kind of nervous <laughs> to be here. Uh, no, don't be nervous. So for our listeners that don't know, we've known each other pretty well for a few years, and we talk a lot about many different facets of the art world. And we were speaking last week, and really what prompted you to appear today as a guest is that you pointed out that there's a lot of writing, reporting, and coverage about the art market, about auction data, specific artist markets. And in that context, oftentimes the artists themselves are excluded entirely from these conversations. So we're really excited to have you on to chat about this in more depth. And I recapped our conversation there a little bit that we had last week. But to start things off, tell us what you mean by artists being excluded from this dialogue about their markets. It seems like you've been thinking about this for a while and you feel it's important for an artist to have a voice in this conversation. Yeah, well, thank thank you, Adam. Um, First of all, for just being responsive. And um, I just, I've noticed that in the, you know, in the increase of, I don't know, it seems like there's just an increase in discussions about, about the art market in general, like. I just see less and less sort of about art and more about the market. And, you know, we could get into that. It is what it is. But as as an artist, um, it's weird to sort of be further excluded from a dialogue that's sort of predicated upon the very thing that, that you create. And so, um, yeah, so it was really cool when I was like, hey, it's so weird. Nobody talks to artists about any of this. And then you said, well, let's talk about it. So, um, yeah, I, I find it really weird that artists are excluded from these discussions. Um, I think, I mean, it's called the art market. It's not called the collector market or like, the, you know, the the whatever else market. And and I am romantic, but artists are the ones who make the art. So. Um, you know, I think that there are forces at work that exercise this kind of exclusion as a form of control. And as the market has grown and grown, there is a hefty sector of this market that is predicated upon the exploitation of artists. Um, And I do not say that lightly. I really mean that. Like, period and full stop is a fact and keeping artists sort of ignorant or keeping people ignorant of the experience of artists um is is bad and it's actually bad for everybody um it stops artists from being able to ask for what is fair or to know um what might be their right position um it also may ultimately stop 
people who are having these interactions in this space from treating each other with decency. And, um, you know, I think that's really important because I think there's so much, there's so much data, people are trying to extract things from the data, but ultimately it's people and relationships that um, I think form the basis of, of everything we're doing in the art world and in the art market. And um, when people don't play a zero sum game, because it's not, it's not a zero sum game, um, better things happen. Artists actually can get more share in the market that is built on ourselves. And um, this is important because also we care about the future of our art and like what our art does, what is even sort of, you know, spiritually communicated. And so um, enhancing these relationships between people is a really important part of the care of the art. Um, I do have a couple other things, so I'm sorry this is a little long. No, that's all right. <laughs> but, it's all right. Yeah, go ahead. And it's, I totally understand that the art world and its markets have been seen, you know, have been seen as a kind of black box, like very opaque, hard to grasp. Right, Adam? Isn't, isn't that something that you had experienced? Like when you, when you were coming out of school, um, did you say it was like that to you? Yeah, it definitely was. And I think that's the case for most people entering the arts, whether you're an artist or someone who wants to work at a gallery or even a collector. And so really for everyone, the art market's very opaque when you're entering and you just have to learn through trial and error. Hopefully you can speak with someone who's more experienced and they can offer you good advice and guidance. And I think personally for you, You've had so much success in the last few years, and now you're reading your own name in these kind of art market reports and in the media. And I remember you said to me, hey, this report, it mentioned me. They should have just reached out to me. I wonder why they didn't. In yeah. fact, they probably didn't reach out to any of the artists in this report, despite the artists being the actual people who made all the art that constitutes all the data that's in this report. But there is really a division where you have the art on one side and the art market on the other side, and there isn't this overlap. And... There's this idea, right, you shouldn't talk to artists about the market, and artists don't want to talk about the market, and aren't focused on the market. And, you know, traditionally, I think artists have mostly been told to ignore the market and focus on their studio practice and their art, and things will kind of fall into place. How much do you think that mindset still exists today, and does this kind of stigma make it even more difficult for an artist to navigate the art world? Yeah, well, I think you just like hit all the next big questions <laughs> there. <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm going to unpack it a little slowly. Um, okay, so yeah, like I think, you know, okay, so I'll address like what you said. There's, you know, in the conversations about the market, um, you know, recently I've been seeing a lot of, um, things that are called studies with data points. Um, I, I find these, and I'm very dubious about, about these analyses because I don't think data points are ever going to be a substitute for experience. And, um, you know, there's a lot of confirmation bias and false correlations being formed because I think when we hear data, we think, oh, well, that sounds scientific. People are handling that um, appropriately and like with care. And, and I, I just don't see the same standards being exercised in the art world as in other um, industries with the same type of work. So, you know, like, artist experience and labors are really left out of these analyses. You know, there was a recent publicized research that noted a relationship between, it was something like, it was like, we've noticed a relationship between how many collectors like this picture of Emily May Smith's work and how her works are performing at auction. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so are you literally saying these, these Instagram likes are causal or predictive of, of like, a financial outcome of a resale at auction. And, you know, to me, that's just like a kind of insane correlation. It's like, um, you know, it sort of leaves out like, 
you know, first of all, I didn't put that painting at auction. It doesn't really have to do with me. Second of all, like I am 42 years old and I have been working my ass off for 20 years <laughs> at <laughs> art and like making art and being good at it. And like, you know, caring so deeply about this thing. And um, these, these sort of, these sort of like hot takes don't really, um, don't really compare to like the depth of experience. And I think like, you know, the depth of commitment that most artists really have. So then there's this kind of myth created that like artists and artwork can kind of just like happen. And, and there's an almost kind of like ease with it that I think builds a form of resentment in the industry. And so it kind of makes other artists resent, resent the artist because it, it looks easy. And it's not. And it makes people in the industry feel like the abuses that they levy are justified because it's like dehumanized. Because like, if it's just transactional, there's no relationship there. But but Adam, you and I know that that I, I mean, I might still be naive, but I think like, actually, the, the, the relationships being like respectful, and like decent and real is really important. And, and that these portrayals of these like fast transactions and just data point driven acts of, you know, buying and selling and whatever, that doesn't actually get you far in the art world, <laughs> you know? So yeah, well, I mean, the art world is a pretty small place actually. And I agree with a lot of what you just said. And I do have to say that I think these data-driven market reports, they can be quite interesting. But for me, it's a small slice of the whole picture as to what's going on. And if you're trying to look at an artist's market, for example, only through that lens, well, you're missing a lot of other factors. Like, who is the gallery that they're showing with? What are the gallery and the artist's priorities? What are their long-term goals? What do museum curators think about the work? Who's the work being sold to? So there are a lot of things that should be considered and factored in. But I do want to get back to this issue of the artist and this stigma of ignoring the market because with social media, with Instagram, as well as so much art market coverage online, just on different online platforms and publications, it's it's hard to ignore it. It's so in your face in a lot of ways. What have your personal experiences been with this? Well, there. okay, so I guess, you know, I don't really have experiences outside my experiences. Right. So, right, so that's true. You know, so this, so this, um, so this, okay. So like the, the, you know, the, the heat and prevalence of these sort of new now uh, markets and like the auctions and stuff, you know, a lot of these are living artists who are working right now. My work's been in these things. So we can't not see <laughs> we can't not see what's going on there. I mean, it's, um, I'm just really dubious at the idea that, 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 you know, somehow we're supposed to not take notice or be involved or um, have a feeling about, about it. Because um, to me, that would be, it would be such a privilege to be in that position. I, I don't really know anyone privileged enough to be able to totally ignore um, these types of situations. I mean, artists tend to be people who work really, really hard. And, you know, there's kind of a funny myth out there that's like, oh, artists are bad at money. It's like, actually, I think artists are really good at money. Artists t often have to have day jobs. And then those day jobs support this other job, which is like the art job <laughs> and pay a lot of different rents at once and have a lot to um, deal with in terms of like the cognitive drain on getting through the day, maintaining all of the things that have to happen in life and, you know, try to create. Um, and so, um, yeah, it just to me seems weird to think that that artists don't know or aren't watching and and to sort of keep artists at bay, like away from this. It just sounds it sounds suspicious to me because it's, you know, because of my own life experiences. Anytime someone's like, oh, hey, you know, you don't really need to know about that. You don't need to worry about that. That's never been said to me in, in, a, in a way that was 
caring for my needs. That was always said to me in a way that was meant to subjugate me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, you know, I think about like, mm, you know, how it sounds really sort of, you know, patriarchal and kind of um, patronizing, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, that said, what 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 can artists do like what is what is it like to watch this like yes there is a part of my brain that i have to turn off and not and not watch and not pay attention and 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 just focus on the work but but i'm capable of doing more than one thing right it's like we're we're all complex people we can have different roles in our life like i can um i can do my best to know what's happening with my work when it leaves my studio. Um, and I care to know, and I care to try to have some say in it or control it as best as possible because I deeply care about the work, not because I care about the market, but it's like, I I deeply care about my artwork and it's and it leaves me and it's gonna go on this adventure, like through time and space and I want it to get as far as possible you know because I've put so much into this thing that I care about so I will want to make sure that the ship that the artwork is traveling in is sound is as sound as possible and so that's why as an artist if I have the ability to um you know have say in the in where the work is going and its placement and you know how much I feel I should be compensated for it um yeah I'm I am going to take that I am going to be a part of that um you know it's um and there really are um standards for things that that are made to seem really uh opaque like you know like when 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 first starting and you're having a first or second show how much should your how much should your your creation costs well there there are there are conventions that determine these things it's not actually that mysterious so i just think that getting through you know these experiences and like man wow is it an adventure is also just talking to other artists and learning from other artists and i just want to encourage people to do that as much as possible um and um you know there is no I don't think there is anything to replace actual experience and and time put in and dedication. So um, yeah, so I went on a little bit of a rant there, but like, you know, I can watch what's happening. I can understand what's happening. I can, you know, do my best to exert whatever controls I have. And then I can also take my foot off of that gas pedal and put it on the other gas pedal or the brakes or, you know, now I'm going to, you know, spend the next half of my day, like, concentrating on this painting that I'm so excited about, and is like, you know, doing something for me that nothing else does, like, I can do both those things. And, and like, this idea that artists can't do that is weird to me. Like, you know, like you, you know, you can be at home, like Adam, you, you, you're at home, you're a father, you're a husband, and then you go out in the world and, you know, you're also like an art advisor and a person in business, you know, you can occupy all those roles, right? So there's something weird to think about that artists can't also do that. And I think many, many, many do. And, and yeah, the, the, the preservation of the myth is, is disturbing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And when I have conversations with younger artists, and I've talked about this before on the podcast. I tell them they need to be entrepreneurial. With Instagram, it's a lot easier to get your art seen by others and to connect with people than it ever has been in the past. And so what does it mean for an artist to be an entrepreneur? Well, I think it means that in addition to thinking about your art and perfecting that and always working on that, you need to think about marketing, networking, strategy, creating opportunities for yourself through studio visits, group exhibitions, solo exhibitions, gallery representation. Just be out there. Try to create as many opportunities for yourself as you can. And you don't have to be an expert in all of these areas, but know just a little bit to get by. And I'm sure this may be quite difficult if you aren't taught this or shown how to do this in school or from someone you know. It's been a kind of fun, I mean, to me, I really try 
you know, I tr- I try to, I think I'm a really curious person and I sort of try to look at being an artist as like such an incredible adventure because I, I get to have all these different roles, which is so cool. Like I get to be an entrepreneur. I get to be a business person. I get to be an artist. I get to have visions. I get to, you know, <laughs> philosophize. Yeah. Like I get to do all these things and how amazing is that, right? But sure, like I didn't come out you know, I didn't come with like an entire toolbox ready to go. So it's been an absolute learning experience. And, um, you know, yes, like at some point you form an LLC and then at some point you get incorporated and like, it's, it's wild. It's totally wild. And, and these are realities that artists have to face. And, you know, many people are like, yeah, duh, that's, that's business. But, but a lot of times, if you really spend all of your time in art school, um, or, you know, as a craftsperson or coming from a kind of more working class background, you aren't necessarily exposed to those structures and how they work. So it's been a very cool experience. And um, I think one of the things I've enjoyed the most is because um, there is like, a, I mean, I have like a professorial side because I, I did teach at a few universities for a while mm-hmm. and um, I enjoyed it a lot. and. Um, I mean, there is a part of me that like, it's been so much fun to actually talk with other artists about these things and problem solve this stuff together. Um, When I can get advice from someone else, you know, I'm so excited to get it. But also when I can give the advice, I'm super happy to. And um, it's been a kind of, you know, cool way to have colleagues and friends, um, you know, of course, we'll like talk about ideas and, um, you know, lots of different aspects of life, but also how to just continue functioning and stay alive um, and, you know, be a working artist, like in, in the United States and the conditions that we live in today, it's, it's, it's something that we actually like, I think must discuss in order to survive. Um, Because the bottom line is, we, you know, artists need money, (laughs) artists need money. And we don't have, we don't have public funding for artists, like in this country. And we so we have to figure out how to, you know, get ourselves the resources that we need to have studios to have supplies, you know, to have time, like time is the thing that, you know, you exchange for money a lot of, you know, a lot. So, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a huge reality. It's like a huge part of being an artist in New York where it's so expensive and it's just like, so, um, so difficult to survive really. Um, yeah. So I don't know, just, um, it's, it's something that I think I imagine, I don't know. I, I, I imagine um artists like in school for example who are not exposed to any market stuff um there i know there is a thirst for that kind of knowledge right like what am i going to do with my life how am i going to make it how do i survive and um you know there are a few tips for for i think that you know some of it might just sound really um obvious but maybe not um sometimes the obvious stuff is the thing you need to hear um back to what we were saying about data earlier um and you know how much data there is and how much interest there is in data um actually as an artist your own data about your own work is very 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 valuable and you should have it from the beginning if you can keep a spreadsheet keep you know files and folders try to be organized your images, the titles, dates, dimensions, like provenance, your CV, like try to keep that stuff in order from the very beginning, even if you, you know, feel unimportant or whatever, you you need it later. And it's really valuable information for you to have. And, and ultimately, other people actually really deeply want that information. So you are the holder of, of a valuable package, which is your own data. Um, so um, do yourself a favor and like get all that stuff together and start keeping track of it now <laughs> because um, um, 
I'm working on a monograph right now and I kept really good data on my work since 2014, but I didn't keep it before that because I wasn't really having shows and, you know, other people didn't seem to think my work was very important and didn't matter. So I kind of just like loosely, you know, threw things around in my computer when I had the chance, but now I'm going back and I like desperately need that information and it's really hard to find. So um, that's, that's sort of one thing I would definitely say to people who are, you know, rising artists who are not exposed to art markets in school, you know, this doesn't really sound like market advice, but it is, it is kind of like business advice. Um, yeah. Have keep your data. Yeah. And, and that's a free win, right? It's so easy to manage your data, your records, your high res images, put it on Dropbox or somewhere in the cloud to protect yourself in case your computer crashes or your galleries lose all the files somehow. And I think it's easy early in your career to not really focus on that, especially if you have work in a group show or in a one-off exhibition. If the gallery really isn't fully invested in you, they may not be thinking about preserving these kind of records for you. And so you might not be thinking about it, but it's really up to you. Yeah. And, you know, in that, in that is like another thing, which is that, you know, typically your gallery is not your parent. Like your gallery is your business partner <laughs> and, and like sometimes business partnerships fail and sometimes, you know, somebody does something wrong and, or, or, or maybe nobody does something wrong, but the business relationship has to end. So, um, you know, I would encourage artists to, to, yes, your gallery needs to have all of this data as well to do, to do the business they need to do, but you need to have it yourself and keep it for yourself in a separate package from what the gallery has. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And no, that's interesting because I think a lot of people in the art world who aren't artists or work at galleries don't fully understand the dynamics of the relationship between an artist and their gallery. And right, what's the responsibility of the gallery? Like you said, they aren't a parent. And so speaking about you, as of a few years ago, things have really changed in terms of museum acquisitions, galleries you work with, auction prices. What has that experience been like and how have you changed the way that you, alongside your galleries, manage your career as a result of this success? Yeah, um, well, so it's funny. I, I you know, being, being very romantic, I, I always thought that uh, a kind of career with market success or sales or whatever would actually like give me more time to paint, <laughs> but it's the kind of the opposite. So um, increasingly I have to find ways to um, have other people do things that, that are part of the management of this ship in my metaphor, <laughs> my metaphor of like, you know, this, this cocoon that my artwork lives in that, that protects it as it goes out in the world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so, you know, I have to ask for help from the gallery. I have to hire someone to come work in my studio to like do some of that stuff, um, be on the computer, take care of lots of information management so that, so that I can actually go paint because the more, the more things happen, the more, um, you know, the more, projects you do then then the more stuff there is to manage around it so um so surprisingly um you know and that's what I really want to do is I want to be I want to be at my easel making my painting and that's the thing I really love to do and so if I don't actually get enough time in the week to do that I feel crazy <laughs> like like it is bad for <laughs> it is bad for my health and the health of those around me <laughs> so so to really like find ways to um to keep and to get that time back um have been about like business management stuff um you know and we can keep we can keep going into that i mean that could be like a whole other you know conversation <laughs> like how do you run a studio how do you learn how to run a studio um you know it's um yeah there's um i would say that's sort of the biggest surprise is like you think you're going to, I, I thought I would have more time, but then I, I have less, I have less and less time. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, that's, that's kind of shocking. Yeah. 
And have you talked with other peers who are artists about how to manage all of that? Is that something artists typically do or, or are you more figuring it out on your own? So I, I have a couple friends that that's something we talk about a lot. Um, um, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I really only have like maybe three people that, that we, we talk about this a lot. Um, so it's not a huge network of friends discussing it, but um, it's also, um, you know, it's, it, it, you know, share what you can, but then also each person's on their own journey. Right. So, <laughs> so, so I've also learned a lot from, you know, practical experience working for other artists and in other art studios. And um, I've also learned from other people's mistakes, which is a huge thing. Like when, when you see, Oh, you know, they should have done this. They should have done that. And you can kind of see how that's co coming out. You know, you can, you can take that information and um, you know, use it, to change your personal outcomes. <laughs> so, um, and you learn from your own mistakes in so many ways, or, or at least I do. I learn a lot from my own mistakes and you talk to someone you trust and they say, yeah, that happened to me 10 years ago. And yes. here's how that went. And I've done it this way ever since. And then I make a mental note and say, okay, I won't do that again. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I try to, I, I mean, I really do try to share those mistakes with people around me and, and maybe younger artists that I'm in contact with who like, I'm like, Hey, I screwed this up here's some information so you don't do that, you know? And I think that's part of the not pretending like this is a zero sum game. I mean, you know, this is, it's, it's sort of an instrument of oppression is to make everyone feel like they're fighting for the same piece of pie. And the, you know, this is not my metaphor. This is a friend, a friend said this to me once. She said, what, what is the deal with that? Make the pie bigger. Also the pie is getting bigger, whether or not you want to believe it. Right. So um, you know, it's funny, like artists thinking like, oh, you know, there's, there's only a few slots for artists and we have to like be assholes to each other because we're gonna, you know, there can only be one. And it's, it's actually not true. You know, who's more replaceable is that there's more and more millionaires in the world who are rather interchangeable, to be honest. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's for the people who need to be fighting for the pie. <laughs> you know, maybe artists need to not uh, maybe artists need to, I really want to encourage community. And I'm like, I really want people to talk to each other. Um, you know, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. And so before we let you go, I know one thing you really like to do is speak to artists in school or just out of school and offer some advice based on your own experiences. And on this podcast, we actually have a lot of listeners who are artists around the world in many different situations. And I'm sure they'd love to hear a few pieces of advice you can offer to them as they try to enter or navigate this amazing art world, maybe some okay, mistakes sure, that sure. you experienced yeah. <laughs> and they can hopefully avoid. Uh, so, yeah, so I'd love if you could share a few that come to mind. And, you know, so these, so these are really based on my experiences. So, you know, please, please do take that. Um, you know, we each come from our own socioeconomic background, our own access to, um, you know, to, to other artists or not, or, um, you know, sometimes a person lives in a place where there is no art world. And, and so like your step is going to be get closer to a lot of other artists, step one, you know? So, so um, there's that like one, have a community, you know, sometimes you find that by going to school, Sometimes you, you know, but you need other artists around you. You really, you really do, um, I think. Um, and, and, you know, rising tides lifts all ships. So um, next is get practical experience, um, whatever that means to you. Um, I, I think get into a working artist studio and learn from them. Um, you will touch materials that you wouldn't have had access to, and it might change how you see things. Um, I worked for someone who uh, was, painting on really nice linen and I thought oh this is great what the hell am I painting on and I you know I was like when I can <laughs> yeah. when I can up up my you know up my up my materials I'm going in this direction and like what an incredible thing for me to learn and, and you know would I have what I have known would I have you know taken the risk to go to go buy that really expensive piece of material in the store when without without having um you know a surefire you know 
profit from it. You know, it's it's a really hard thing to do sometimes. So sometimes there's all kinds of things you learn um, by being in or working in another artist studio. That said, I think free internships are total bullshit and I hope nobody's doing that anymore. <laughs> Artists, if you have people working for you, pay them well because that is terrible when like we internalize the abuses um, levied upon us in the art world and then exercise them on each other. That is bad. So break the cycle, pay your assistants reasonably and well. <laughs> um, <laughs> next is financial success and public recognition might take a long time to reach. It might take a very long time. It may not even happen in your lifetime. We don't, you just don't know. I think social media makes it look easy. It makes it look like it's an inevitable. I think, you know, it's, it's funny. It's like, yes, please have an unbridled and wild belief in your, in yourself. Like, please do have that, but also know that maybe there's a chance other people are not going to see it and, and that it's going to take, it's going to take time. And there just is no replacement for the time and energy invested in doing your work. And though it might be recognized, it might not be recognized that time and energy is never lost. Even if someone doesn't recognize it, even if the thing doesn't sell, it's like, it's like the first law of thermodynamics. Energy is not lost or gained. It is converted. <laughs> so, um, you know, there is, like I said about this myth, I think there is a portrayal of, of a kind of ease with which one flows into this, you know, marketplace and, um, and that, oh, it's just so easy to have these transactions, do these shows and like sell these works. And, and it's hard <laughs> and it takes a long time for a lot of people. Um, okay, last, if your work is out of fashion or out of vogue, good for you. You're at the start of something else that's probably next. Um, I don't know a lot about investment advice, but I would think that there's a kind of thing, like, I've heard this kind of thing said, like, well, if you would have bought so-and-so stock 10 years ago, guess what you would have now? Well, it's the same thing. It's like, it's like, you know, if you're not doing what's like super cool and everybody's looking at right now, perhaps you're that, that thing 10 years ago, you're that thing 10 years from now. So, you know, that's, that really comes back to a place where you need to ignore, not ignore, but sort of keep your eye on how the tides are moving out there and sort of like watch for the wave that's coming for you. So, you know, when to catch it. It, you know, don't, don't chase after like something that's already moved past you. It's like a, a loss of energy if you try to stay true to sort of what you're making and like do your best with your work. You're in a better position actually to catch the next moment. I love all of those, especially that last one. It's nice to hear someone say it because <laughs> I think if you're chasing a trend, it won't work out. It'll end up being derivative of what's already out there, and you yeah. probably won't be reaching your potential as an artist. Well, I mean that that was my experience. I I I had, you know, I I graduated. I finished graduate school in um, two thousand six. The recession started. It actually started in two thousand seven. <laughs> it was in full blown swing in two thousand and eight. And then what I was doing was not what was cool was not in fashion and um you know sure you can you can you can do what you can to kind of like bend your work to be legible to people but there is something to be said for like it's you know sort of seeing when it's your time um so um you know and during that time just gaining lots of experiences gaining lots of knowledge Emily, thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. We really enjoyed this conversation. We touched on so many interesting topics, and it was especially fascinating coming from your unique perspective. We're really happy you came on to chat with us, and we hope to have you back on again soon. Thanks, Adam. Um, I, I will be happy to come back, and mm -hmm. um, maybe, I don't know, if anybody has like questions that, that would be something we would talk about. And um, maybe... 
ask another artist to come on <laughs> sometime. <laughs> I will. Really you're nice. going to start. I will. You're, you're going to start the trend. So I, <laughs> okay. I definitely will. So thank you for that. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. Perfect. All right. Appreciate it. Speak soon. This week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast is brought to you by Artbase. Are you managing an art collection, an artist studio, or even a gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? Well, Artbase is the right software to manage your art business. Artbase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. You just enter your data once and use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and so much more. And they've got a brand new version out right now with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com to learn more and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount.